With so, that, I'm excited to um, be introducing up Sergio Morano. Um, so he is actually um, over. He's, um, he's actually over at Hallmark as one of the directors, I believe, correct? Um, and beyond that, one of the things that he actually is up here to talk about is his journey, um, kind of going through religion originally, falling out of religion, and then eventually going into Buddhism. Um, and I know that a lot of here, a lot of people here have either um, had interest in Buddhism or have dabbled in it previously before. So I know that there is a lot of interest here already. So I'm excited to already have him in here and to be able to kind of help us kind of come to a better understanding of that. And of course, just like any other um, speaker that we have, we will have an opportunity for you guys to have Q&A at the end. So without further ado, here's Sergio. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I am absolutely delighted to be here with you today. Very happy to be here and share with you. Thank you, Helen, for the invitation. And I'm also very happy to see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of my Dharma sisters and brothers are here. And a lot of my family is here as well. So very thrilled and very happy to be here. The story I want to share with you this morning is a journey story, a travelogue, if you will. The journey metaphor is perhaps the most used when speaking about matters of spirituality and faith. We are traveling. We are walking a path. We have a destination in mind. We meet fellow travelers along the way. You get the idea. And so I'd like to tell you about five of many mileposts along my journey. And these mileposts are books. My childhood was a very happy one, a very happy and fortunate childhood. I come from a line of Nazarene missionaries, preachers, evangelists, and music ministers. The Nazarene Church is a Protestant evangelical church, a denomination, a Christian denomination, that is actually headquartered here in Kansas City. Who would have known? As a church, however, it is better known outside of the United States, and this is because, greatly in part, uh, for its uh, missionary efforts, a lot of missionary work throughout the world. So, uh, my maternal grandparents were missionaries for the church for 25 years. My mother, Joyce, who happens to be here today, was born in Montevideo, Uruguay, because her parents were missionaries in South America. On my father's side, my grandparents were pastors and superintendents for the Nazarene Church in Mexico. They were kind of a BFD in the Nazarene royalty in Mexico. <laughs> um, and so my dad, as well, uh, has had a musical evangelistic ministry for well over 40 years. So, the first milepost on this journey is, of course, the Holy Bible. As a child in the ministry, I was immersed in the church, especially in the work of evangelistic outreach. And I loved it. I loved everything about it. I was convinced from early on that I was to follow in the footsteps of my father and my grandfathers before me. I would preach the gospel, the good news of salvation as told in God's word. I read the Bible fervently and I felt that my life had a specific purpose and meaning. I loved church. I loved everything, well, almost everything about church. I started my own musical ministry as a teenager with my sister, who also happens to be sitting here. And we played a lot of shows, we made a few records, we were also kind of a big deal in Mexico and in the Christian music, contemporary Christian music circuit. Um, but most importantly, we preached the gospel. That was what we did. I was always, always involved in church with the youth group, leading prayer vigils, leading worship. And <clears throat> so when the time came for me to go to college, I did, in fact, follow in the footsteps of my father. And I went to Southern Nazarene University in Oklahoma, which is what he had done for me. I enrolled and I chose to be a religion and ministry major. I was convinced, without a doubt, that I had been called 
to the ministry. And it would be about four years before I realized that that call had reached the wrong number. <laughs> we learn a lot about ourselves as we travel. And along this journey, one of the things I learned about myself early on was that I'm very curious. As I worked my way through systematic theology, biblical criticism, hermeneutics, exegesis, philosophy, and ministry, church growth, I found that some of the questions that I would not have dared ask before were now fair game. So I asked. I asked about the historical Jesus. And I asked about biblical inerrancy. And I asked about the plausibility of fitting two of every kind of animal on one <laughs> big ship. <laughs> And seriously, why does the creation account in Genesis 2 so clearly contradict the account in Genesis 1? And can we really trust the translations of the Bible when we don't have anything remotely resembling the original manuscripts? With every semester, I found the foundations of my once solid conviction crumbling in a sea of unanswered and unanswerable questions. And in my last semester, having a few extra credits to fill, I enrolled in an elective course, World's Living Religions. I was curious to learn about other religions, and so that brought me to the second milepost, The World's Religions by Houston Smith. <coughs> Houston Smith is highly regarded as an authority on the history of religions, and this book in particular is perhaps his most popular book. It has sold millions. It also happened to be the textbook for world's living religions. I enjoyed the readings so much, and I was thrilled to be learning for the first time about different ways of thinking, about different ways of believing, about different ways of seeing and understanding the world. But then we hit a rough patch along the road. You see, this class was not designed as a survey of religions, or not even designed as a comparative religions class. Here's how it actually went down. Each class, we would spend the first few minutes talking about the religion for that week. Let's say, for instance, Islam. And then the professor would hand out photocopied case studies, as he called them. And what we did was, in small groups, read these case studies and devised our best and most effective strategies for how to convert a Muslim to Christianity. <laughs> That was my reaction. <laughs> now this would have made perfect sense to me as a freshman, but as a fifth year senior whose faith was already hanging from a thread, it seemed absolutely immoral, reprehensible. I mean, how very dare he. Right around that patch of road, I met a fellow traveler with whom I became fast friends. I was working part-time at a coffee max and Khalid Gattash was a coworker of mine. We had a lot in common, similar interest in music. We both loved Metallica. We had similar humor, <laughs> loved making fun of our manager. And he was my first Muslim friend. After a while, as we started talking and getting to know each other better, and as you do, we started talking about religion, and he tried to convert me to Islam. <laughs> I kindly said no, but I did accept his invitation to go to mosque for Friday prayers. And I loved it. It was a lot of fun. It's very interesting. And then I started asking myself even more questions. How can he be so certain about his religion, just as certain as I have been about my own? Could we both be right? Is that even possible? One of us has to be wrong. What if we're both wrong? What then? What then? I wrote my final paper for World's Living Religions on the ethics, or lack thereof, of missionary work. The professor didn't find it very clever. <laughs> and he gave me a D, the only D I got in college. The road became even narrower and more treacherous as I graduated with a degree with which I had no idea what I would do. I was wondering earlier as I listened to this wonderful community moment if recovery from religion had been around, would I even be giving this talk today? 
what would I do? It was my dark night of the soul moment, wrestling, struggling, wanting with all my heart and all my might to believe, but finding myself painfully unable to. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over the course of a few years. But I remember clearly the morning I woke up, sat on the side of my bed, and thought to myself, I think I've stopped believing in God. It was at once exciting and scary as hell. Losing the foundation of everything you've ever believed in, everything that has shaped your life, is nothing to sneeze at. Those were long, lonely, confused, scary months. I had a girlfriend at the time, a brilliant, beautiful Nazarene girl, with whom I was getting quite serious. I was afraid that upon confessing my lack of belief, she might leave me because of that whole unequally yoked thing. Just a tiny little detail. But I gathered the courage one night and I told her. She was sad, perhaps even shocked, but she said, let's just see how things go. 15 years later, we're still seeing how things go. They're going pretty great, I think. <laughs> But maybe you should ask her, she's the curly one sitting at the front. <laughs> at any rate, back to my dark night of the soul in college. That is when I arrived at the next mile post. Carl Sagan, the demon haunted world. I had gone through several of the stages of grief after losing my faith. Shock, denial, anger, and I was beginning to enter the stage of acceptance when Carl Sagan came into my life. Or perhaps when I accepted Carl Sagan into my life. <laughs> I actually used to joke that Carl Sagan was my personal Jesus. The demon-haunted world was a thrilling experience. It was as if all the awe and all the wonderment that I had lost along with my faith were back. I had it again. I could be in awe and wonder. Here was a new light to shine along my path. Science as a candle in the dark. And I just fell in love with science. This was the book that convinced me once and for all that I rather preferred questions to answers. That I found questions more interesting and more exciting than answers. And that the more questions that one could ask, the better. And this was the book that gave me a new life verse. Ubi dubium, ibi libertas. Where there is doubt, there is freedom. I just couldn't get enough of Carl Sagan. I watched every single episode of Cosmos, the original version, at least two or three times. It's on Netflix, by the way, you can watch it too. And the new version is not bad at all. Um, I, read, I read several of Carl Sagan's other books, and I began to feel comfortable in my skin again. Acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. I was back on a happy stretch of road, and it lasted a good long while. I was free to explore. The possibilities were endless. There were billions and billions of possibilities. Where there is doubt, there is freedom. And one night, as I attended a presentation on Buddhism given by Lama Chuck Stanford from the Rime Center, your neighbor's just down the street, actually, my interest was piqued. Everything he said about Buddhism sounded quite appealing to me. I mean, I was skeptical and all, but he didn't say anything that made me feel like I needed to pull out my baloney detection kit. <laughs> So after his talk, and after enough people had left the room, I approached him timidly with one single question. Is it possible for an atheist to be a Buddhist? Why yes, of course! <laughs> he replied, there is no deity or god in Buddhism. We don't worship any deity or god. A lot of Buddhists are atheists. I 
found that intriguing, recalling what little I remembered from Houston Smith's chapter on Buddhism from back in college. But several years went by before I arrived at the next milepost, The Way of the Bodhisattva by Shanti Deva. One night about five years ago, my sister Christy asked me if I knew anything about that rhyme center uh, off of I-35 in Southwest Boulevard. A lot of people think it's rhyme. It's actually Rime. It looks like rhyme. And I said, uh, I had never been, but I told her about the talk I had heard a few years back. And I said, my golly, I, I ought to go visit. I've just been putting it off. And so one Sunday morning, I did. I checked it out. I was immediately put off by all the images, the bright, bold, almost gaudy colors. But there was something about that place, the people, that captured my attention. I kept going every Sunday and eventually enrolled in the 12-week uh, Basics of Buddhism class. I started to learn about the historic Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who is seen and understood to have been a simple man like you and me of flesh and blood, who lived, who taught, who died. And I learned about the four noble truths, the truth of suffering, the truth of the cessation of suffering. I learned about the Eightfold Path, and that I learned that the Rime Center practices in the Tibetan tradition. And not only that, but that Rime, the word Rime means non-sectarian. So what that meant for the Rime Center is that they welcomed and encouraged teachers and students and practitioners from all variety of Buddhist traditions, non-dogmatic, non-sectarian. And most importantly, I learned the practice of meditation. Now, Buddhism is most definitely a non-theistic religion, so much so that many practitioners prefer to refer to it as a philosophy rather than a religion. But the thing that really got me was that all questions, all questions were welcome and encouraged here. This is one of my favorite pictures of all time, as you can imagine, my personal Jesus and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Carl Sagan once asked His Holiness the Dalai Lama what he as a Buddhist would do if a discovery in science conflicted with Buddhist doctrine. And the Dalai Lama replied that even Buddha was said to question his teachings and that Buddhists rely on doctrine as findings rather than scripture. The Buddha himself taught his disciples and his students not to accept any of his teachings simply because he had said them, but to go and test them and find them to be true for themselves and only then accept them. The next class I took at the Rime Center was the Way of the Bodhisattva. Now there are two primary schools of Buddhism, uh, the Theravada school of Buddhism and the Mahayana school of Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, which are two of the most well-known uh, schools of Buddhism in the West, belong to the Mahayana school of Buddhism. And in the Mahayana school of Buddhism, the ideal is that of the Bodhisattva. Simply put, very simply put, uh, there have been thousands of pages written on commentary about bodhisattvas. A bodhisattva is one who wishes to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. So, attaining liberation from suffering for the benefit of all others. Finding, as we heard earlier, something greater than yourself and endeavoring and striving for it. That is the bodhisattva. And the way of the Bodhisattva, this book, is the most studied and revered text among Buddhist scholars as it regards this subject and the subject of bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, another term, simply means awakened mind. Bodhi, awakened, citta, mind, from the Sanskrit. And bodhicitta is the motivation of a Bodhisattva. But I'm getting a little too technical and a little too geeky, so I apologize for that. Back to my personal story. What I want to tell you about this milestone is that as I walked this stretch of the path, I began to find that Buddhism made so much sense to me. The ideals of compassion, loving kindness, the pursuit of wisdom, it all resonated so much with me. Many years back, I had already come to the realization that the one thing all human beings truly want is to be happy. That's all we want. 
the great equalizer. All we want is to be happy. And Buddhists, over the course of 2,500 years of practice, study, and testing, appeared to me to have discovered a way for us to be truly happy, to break free from the cycle of suffering. Now, I'm not saying I bought the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. There are still many things I'm working through. Take rebirth, for instance. The title of this story is Born Again Buddhist, and it is a bit cheeky, but I am a sucker for alliteration. <laughs> and I'm playing with this whole notion of rebirth, which as you may know, is a kind of a big deal for Buddhists. Recently, however, I heard a two-minute argument for rebirth that I found rather compelling. And it didn't come from a Buddhist, it actually came from a Wiccan priest. And it goes as such. I know the person I was when I was 13. I am no longer that person. I know the person I was when I was 21. I am no longer that person. I know the person I was when I was 32. I am no longer that person. I have lived many lives. As I continue to practice meditation and receive teachings on the middle way of Buddhism, the union of compassion and wisdom, the practice of the four immeasurable qualities being loving kindness, equanimity, empathetic joy, and compassion, I began to experience a change in myself. I was healing. I was becoming more accepting, more responsive, and less reactive. I found that the teachings and the practice worked for me. I found that Buddhism asked a lot of the same questions that I was so curious about. The nature of time, the nature of space, the nature of mind, interconnectedness, and the answers were becoming more and more satisfactory. I don't remember the moment I decided that I was a Buddhist, but I do remember feeling that perhaps I had been a Buddhist all along and I was just now finding out. Which brought me to the fifth and most recent milepost. The Holy Bible. Yes, that's correct, the Bible. I never imagined the path would lead me to the very point where my journey started. But Buddhism does teach that we are stuck in cyclic existence. So it only makes sense that I would come full circle. We call this samsara. Only this milepost was not the same, or rather, the traveler was not the same. Where I had once felt deceived, disappointed, and angry, I now found that my Buddhist practice allowed me to see the truth that all anybody ever wants is to be happy and free from suffering. Last year, I took six months to do a project I called Stories of Devotion in which I interviewed people from all faiths and also people with no religious attachment or beliefs. I visited places of worship and I experienced religious practices. My theory was that faith is narrative, that narrative gives life meaning, and that understanding what gives meaning to people's lives makes for a more emotionally connected world. And you know what? I love your t-shirts. I can't wait to get a hoodie. <laughs> People are more important than beliefs. That's exactly what I found as I traveled and met with people across the faith spectrum. As part of that project, I read the Bible again, cover to cover. I had a lot of free time. <laughs> Only this time, I read it as the story of the people of God and not as the manual for life that I had been taught to read it as. And you know what? It was fun. It was a lot of fun. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of good stuff in there and a lot of bad stuff too. There's a lot of war and quite a bit of naughty bits. <laughs> Juicy stuff, really. I really wish more people read the Bible. <laughs> but more than anything, the Bible is a story about people from a few millennia ago attempting to understand their place in the world, looking for meaning. I'm not a Christian anymore. I haven't been for many years, but I have a renewed sense of appreciation and love for my Christian friends and family. And that goes as well for my Muslim, pagan, atheist, Jewish, agnostic, and even my spiritual but not religious friends as well. <laughs> This, I believe, is the result of the Buddhist teachings I've received and the meditative practice I've developed. And that is the path my life has taken. 
but I am but one traveler. Thank you. So we're going to open up the floor to Q&A. Um, please wait until someone with a mic comes up to you because we want to make sure that we can get your question on recording as well as his response back to you. Um, I think back here we have a question. Gentlemen, or, or over here. Um, the question is, uh, in your opinion, what makes His Holiness holy? Wait. Pardon me, can you repeat that? What? What makes His Holiness Dalai Lama holy? What makes him holy? Um, this is a very good question and I appreciate it. Um, one thing that happens as you begin to look at world religions is that we use a lot of the same words and a lot of these words don't have the same meaning from one culture to the next, right? His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not only uh, our greatest teacher in Tibetan Buddhism but he's also a political figure and this is a title. It's like saying His Eminence, it's like saying, uh, you know, the honorable, and so on and so forth. When you ask the Dalai Lama what he is, he will answer, I am but a simple monk. Uh, he is nothing supernatural. He is not holy in the same sense that the Holy Ghost is holy. Um, he is simply uh, someone who we revere and respect as one of our greatest teachers, and as a bodhisattva as well. So, what makes him holy? The title that he holds. Yes. Uh, have you experienced have, well? Have you experienced any tangible benefits from the practice of meditation? And if so, what? Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, when I came to Buddhism about five years ago, uh, I was starting to deal uh, with some personal issues um, around anxiety, um, and uh, I have a lot of friends and fellow meditators who have come to meditation as a way to practice. Um, calm abiding. The, the main practice that we have in our tradition is shamatha meditation, which is calm abiding. And what this is, is a very, very ordinary practice. There's no levitation, there's no moving objects without touching them. It's a very simple and very ordinary practice that anybody, regardless of religious affiliation, can do. All you do is you sit on your ass and you sit very still and you focus on your breathing. And what you are hoping to achieve is to allow your mind to settle into its natural state. To allow your mind to settle, to allow your body to settle, and to connect your mind and your body through your breathing. And in this way, to experience calm and peace. Very simple, very ordinary practice. And I have experienced a great deal of benefit from it. I think I am a more pleasant person to be around since I've been meditating. But you're going to have to ask uh, those who live with me about that um, to confirm. Thank you. What is nirvana? Pardon me? What is nirvana? Nirvana. Uh, nirvana is the state of liberation from cyclic existence. So in Buddhism, our belief and our teaching is that we are caught in this wheel of samsaric existence, the cycle of suffering. And this is why there is rebirth. So nirvana is when you stop being born again. <laughs> so when you finally break free from the cycle of, uh, of suffering, that is what is called nirvana. Um, and so that is the best answer I can give you uh, as a non-scholar, as a lay practitioner. Liberation from the cycle of suffering. Yes? Um, can you talk about what the transition was like for your family as Christians when you, or like how did you denounce yourself as a Christian when you started exploring other avenues to your spirituality? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I was a closet atheist for a very long time. Um, I was very afraid and I was very nervous because my entire circle of family and friends and support uh, are Christian. Um, and I come from a family that is very connected, that has always been kind of very close, very in, in our faces. Um, and so I was closeted for a long time. But at the same time I was very, very fortunate and I continue to be very fortunate because both my mom and my dad uh, have never um, written me off their will or denounced me as a, a non moreno dentin anymore or anything like that, like has happened with a lot of my fellow friends from the religion department. So, um, 
what happened was I just allowed time. I had to go through the stages of grief. I was very angry. When I was a very angry atheist, I was just as fervent about converting everybody to atheism as I had been about converting everybody to Christianity. And I had to get over that. And I had to come to a place of acceptance before I could speak calmly and openly. And really, I kind of just wanted my actions to speak louder than my words. Um, so I have been very fortunate, and I, I would even say I've been very blessed. Um, my dad, who continues to be a minister and is actually doing his ministerial work as I speak, he called me this morning to wish me good luck. And he said, good luck on your talk. Um, he, he will always be a Christian. He has told me, we do not believe the same things, but I will always be his son and he will always love me. And that, nothing will change that. And I know the same is true with my mom. So I have been very, very lucky and I don't take that for granted. Just to extend that previous question just a teensy bit, do you find that you still are operating in the everyday world by the values and morals that you um, internalized as a young person? And do you, or do you feel like you abandoned any of that? Or, or is it a building process where you've just accumulated more values as you've learned more about other beliefs? Oh, I love that question. Um, whether we like it or not, we live in a predominantly Christian nation, right? And a lot of what we uh, have agreed upon as a society is based on some of that Christian ethic, some of those Christian values. And that's arguable because, you know, I would say it's mostly deist uh, rather than theist. However, um, I still continue to consider myself culturally Christian. I love Christmas. I love celebrating Christmas. I love putting up the Christmas tree. I love everything about Christmas. Um, now, do I believe that Jesus was born on December 25th? Hell no. The Bible pretty much denies that. It's impossible. It couldn't have been in the winter. Um, so, in many ways, I operate uh, culturally as, as, a, as a cultural Christian. Um, what I have brought into my life is the values and the practices of Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama often says when he speaks to Western audiences, and I don't like the term Western, I know it's very Eurocentric, but he always says, I don't want anybody to become a Buddhist. It is better that you remain in whatever tradition you are. Uh, there is no proselytizing in Buddhism. Uh, it's actually forbidden. Um, so uh, I think it's been more of adding and taking out some of the things. There are some things I certainly no longer believe, a lot of things actually. Um, but uh, there are a lot of things I love about Christianity. I love going to Mass. I love the bells and whistles and the incense, the music. I just can't, can't fight that. <laughs> Was there one? Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.